But what about war and peace in hadith, which are quotes by the Prophet Muhammad? Let's read them. The Messenger of God said, Do not wish to encounter with the enemy. Pray to Allah to grant you safety, but when you encounter them, show patience. Is that a blood-hungry warlord in your opinion? He's saying we shouldn't wish to encounter any enemies. Next one. In the condition of war, Prophet Muhammad put the following rules. The Prophet said, Go in God's name, trusting in God and adhering to his religion. Do not kill a decrepit old man, or a young infant, or a child, or a woman. Do not be dishonest about spoils. Do right and act well, for God loves those who do well. This is the exact opposite of what we read in the Bible. 1 Samuel 15.3 Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Muhammad is saying don't kill women and children and old people, don't even cut a tree, while in the Bible it says put to death men and women, children and infants. Infants. Amazing how media can completely reverse the truth upside down. Next hadith says, whoever secures a man's blood and then kills him, then I am innocent of this murder, even if the murdered was an infidel. So this hadith clearly says that you cannot kill anyone outside of war situation, even if he is a disbeliever. Still think this is a violent religion? Next one says, whoever kills a mu'ahad, a mu'ahad is a person who is living under peace agreement, shall not smell the fragrance of paradise. Paradise in Islam is the eternal happiness in heaven. So if you kill a non-believer who is peaceful, you will never enter paradise. I still think this is a violent religion. Next one. The messenger of Allah said, Beware if anyone wrongs a mu'ahad, or diminishes his rights, or forces him to work beyond his capacity, or takes from him anything without his consent. I shall plead for this man in the day of judgment. So every peaceful non-Muslim in an Islamic state has all citizenship rights, according to Prophet Muhammad still think this is a violent religion? Next one, the messenger of God said, Peace is one of the names of God. He put it on earth, so spread peace. You will never hear this quote from Prophet Muhammad in the media, ever. I think you already know why. The opening of Mecca is the best example because there is a huge difference between forgiveness and mercy in the position of power and in the position of weakness. Quick recap, pagans of Mecca were the most violent people towards early Muslims. They tortured them, prevented them food and water for years, killed a lot of them, started several wars against them aiming to kill everyone for more than 20 years. In the end, a lot of people accepted Islam and Muslims were larger in numbers and power. So the pagans of Mecca had to surrender to Muhammad. What do you think he did to them after 20 years of constant violence, aggression and murder? He told them, اذهبوا فأنتم الطلقاء Go, you're free, I forgive you. He told them you can stay in your homes. You don't have to become Muslims. You can live peacefully. The only difference is, you shall not be violent criminals anymore. That's it. Still think Muhammad was a bloodthirsty warlord? And this was part of his speech in his last pilgrimage. O people, your God is one. An Arab is not better than a non-Arab. A non-Arab is not better than an Arab. A white person is not better than a black person. A black person is not better than a white person. The one who is better in the eyes of God is the most decent and righteous. When did the West start fighting racism? And finally, this is the constitution that the Caliphate Omar ibn al-Khattab gave to the inhabitants of Palestine in 636 AD. This is what gave the servant of God, Omar, commander of the believers, security to the people of Elia. He gave them security for themselves, their money, their churches, their crosses, and the rest of their faith. Their churches shall not be inhabited, destroyed, or diminished, nor from their space, nor from their cross, nor from any of their money, and they shall not be forced to change their religion, and none of them shall be harmed. This is in 636 AD. When did the West learn about human rights? We're sorry, but we didn't find anything about 72 versions for whoever kills innocent people. We didn't find any act of transgression whatsoever. We only found peace and tolerance and order to prepare and fight back against who fights you, which is the constitution of every country on earth. Live peacefully, but prepare an army to defend yourself. The only difference in Islam, God said that if the army offers peace, then Muslims have to accept peace. And even in the war itself, Muslims can't kill women, children, old men, civilians, animals, or even cut a tree. 
The only difference is there is no Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Islam. The only difference is God ordered Muslims to only conduct defensive wars, and even in these wars, do not hurt civilians. And of course, we are here talking about Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, not about current Muslim countries. Whether they accept and follow Quran or not is another subject. Taking one innocent life is extremism because you're like, it is like taking the life of all of humanity. Extremism means you cannot kill non-combatants even in a just war. After one of the battles, a defensive battle of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he saw a woman dead. He called his uh, soldiers and he said, even in a war, do not kill women and children. So we are supposed to be extra careful not to harm, touch or kill the civilians of the enemy population. On top of it, right, there is no, there is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima, Nagasaki in Islam. Even if the enemy kills your civilian population, even then Islam does not give me the right to harm their civilian population. So lastly about the jihadis, if the enemy inclined towards peace, Muslim soldiers should drop their weapons and incline towards peace, right? And then the last S would be to save lives, to remove the oppression so human lives can be saved. That Islam was spread by the sword. The reply to this allegation is given very well by a famous historian by the name of Delisi O'Leary. He mentions in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8, Delisi O'Leary says, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. I would like to repeat the statement of Delisi O'Leary, the famous historian. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most absurd, fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. When we read history, we come to know that we Muslims, the Arabs, they ruled the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came. For a few years, the French came. But as a whole, the Muslim Arabs were the lords of the Arab lands. Yet today, there are more than 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means they are Christians in generation. These 9 million Arab Christians are giving shahada, are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. That time India was the most powerful country in the world. The Mughals, the Muslims. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to accept Islam at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, in India, more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. Today, the largest populated Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. I am asking the question, which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army came to Malaysia, which has more than 55% Muslims? Which Muslim army? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship. He places our Nabi, Mama Sallallahu Sallam, as his number one hero prophet. Number one. And he writes that every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's mind, it dwells. One man in the full world. It will do little good if he takes up a sword and propagates it. You have to first get your sword, the sword of intellect. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best motivation.